In the course of many encounters in life, certain men and women meet and fall in love. They decide to spend their lives together, getting married and staying committed. It seems simple, but how difficult it truly is. A marriage where both partners truly care for each other is nothing short of a miracle. I am one of those lucky enough to have experienced such a miracle in my life. I met a man in college, and before I knew it, he had become the person I loved. That man, in turn, loved me as well. We graduated and went through various challenges, even facing the brink of breaking up. Yet, we overcame those difficulties and pledged to love each other forever and got married. Our days were ordinary but filled with happiness so deep it could bring tears to my eyes. Walking through life with the person I love was a journey full of smiles. My name is Ashley. I am a 34-year-old housewife working at an IT company. I've been married to my husband Justin for 10 years. Even in our mid-30s, our relationship remains strong. Hey, what should we do on our next day off? Well, how about we go see a movie? It's been a while. Sounds great. I remember there's a good pasta place nearby. How about we have lunch there after the movie? That sounds perfect. We don't have children. But that's not a big deal. I was really looking forward to the movie I wanted to see. However, the night before our day off, he came home late from work, and he seemed different. He looked tired and lacked his usual energy. His complexion wasn't good either. You seem tired. Is work tough? Given that he was working overtime, it was probably hard. As soon as I regretted asking something so obvious, Justin gave me a weak smile. Yeah, well, work is tough, but that's nothing new. But... But what? Well, it's nothing major. He never did tell me the reason. Even during our date the next day, he didn't seem to be enjoying himself, he seemed preoccupied with something else. In the end, I couldn't even focus on the movie plot, and we skipped lunch and went straight home. He continued to act strangely in the following days. He seemed less tired and more like he was worried about something, or had something on his mind. Is something wrong? Even when I asked, Justin would just give a vague smile and deny it. He used to tell me everything. I could tell Justin was hiding something. I wasn't sure if it was something he couldn't tell me or if he thought it wouldn't matter if he did. And so, days of worrying continued for me. Justin seemed to lose more of his energy day by day, and I felt helpless, not knowing what to do. One day. A call came in at work. The moment my coworker told me it was from a hospital, an indescribable fear gripped me. Had my parents collapsed, was there an accident, or? I answered the phone, trembling. As soon as the call ended, I rushed out of the office. When I saw it in the hospital room, my legs nearly gave out. The nurse at the entrance of the hospital room supported my trembling body. I managed to stand on my own feet, trying to suppress my shaking as I approached. Justin was lying on the bed, seemingly asleep. No. He looked like he was asleep. But I already knew from the doctor's explanation that this wasn't the case. We did everything we could. The doctor hung his head apologetically. I was silent. It wasn't anyone's fault. It wasn't anyone's responsibility. It was just fate. A stroke. He had suddenly collapsed at work and never woke up again. The suddenness of the separation left me in such shock that I couldn't even cry, just stood there dazed. His body was still warm when I gently touched him. But the gradually fading color and warmth from his face made reality hit me. His life was no longer here. He would never wake up again. The moment I came back to my senses, I cried intensely. Tears flowed uncontrollably down my cheeks. I'm glad I cried my heart out at the hospital, because I felt overwhelmed by everything that happened afterward. 
I contacted both my parents and my in-laws, and time seemed to fly by in a blur. There was so much to do. Discussing future plans with the hospital. Arranging the funeral. Figuring out who needed to be informed about Justin's passing and contacting them. Researching necessary procedures at government offices and financial institutions to ensure everything could be handled promptly. There was an endless list of things to do. There was no time to grieve, but if I had sat down, I might never have been able to get back up again. Having tasks to focus on kept me going. However, my mother-in-law Kayla was completely devastated. More than me, who had lost a husband, she must have been in deep shock. I could see how much his parents loved him. And I knew how much he loved his parents. I knew that too. This was why Kayla was so deeply shaken, unable to stand. I would have been the same if I didn't have things to do. Still, there was so much I didn't know. With the help of my own parents and my father-in-law Kevin, I somehow managed to proceed with the preparations. Then came the funeral. A large number of people attended, each mourning the untimely loss of Justin. Our mutual friends hugged me gently. Justin's colleagues spoke highly of his character. Justin was so loved by everyone. Feeling proud of Justin helped ease my sorrow a little. The funeral proceeded quietly and seemed to be coming to an end. It was then. A young woman in her mid-twenties, named Elizabeth, suddenly appeared in front of the family seats. Her stomach was noticeably swollen. I felt sorry, thinking she had come all this way despite being pregnant. Thank you for coming today. I said gratefully. Are you Ashley? You're older than I thought. The shock of her words left me speechless. I stared at her, stunned by the suddenness of her statement. Um, how do you know Justin? There's a child of your husband in this belly. What? Her shocking revelation left me silent for a while. Wait, what? Justin's child? What? Ashley, what's wrong? My father, Brian, called out to me, clearly puzzled. Dad, um... As I struggled to explain, Elizabeth pushed me aside and stepped forward. Are you Justin's father? Nice to meet you, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a colleague from the same department as Justin, and I'm pregnant with his child. What? Like father, like daughter. Dad's reaction was exactly the same as mine. As Elizabeth's loud voice drew attention, the guests began to gather closer to the family seating area. Hmm, what should I do in this situation? As I stood there, feeling lost, Kevin came up and asked. What's going on? Oh, Kevin, well... Before I could finish, Elizabeth pushed me aside again. More forcefully this time. She stepped forward and repeated. So, you're his father? Whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm eight months pregnant with Justin's child. So, I deserve a share of the inheritance too. The unexpected declaration left everyone around us stunned and speechless. What is happening here? This woman, with her large belly protruding, stood arrogantly, glaring at me. Is there really a child of Justin's in there? Does this mean that Justin, my husband, was cheating on me? No way. How could this be? We were so close, weren't we? We spent so much time together, right? We had weekly dates, didn't we? And now he's cheating? With another woman and a child? This can't be happening. As I stood there trembling and looking down, the woman seemed to think I was crying. With a victorious smile, she said. He said he didn't need a woman who couldn't have children. He wanted to divorce you and be with me as soon as our child is born. It's unfortunate, but that's how it is. But I'll make sure I get what's rightfully mine. Can't have children? Well, that's true. It's the result of certain circumstances. My body trembled. Then, 
A hand was placed on my shoulder. I turned to see Kayla standing there, with dried tear streaks glistening slightly. Kayla. I looked at her with pleading eyes. Excuse me, what did you just say? There was a fierce anger in Kayla's eyes. Um, I said I'm pregnant with Justin's child. Is that true? It's true. Justin and I were in love. He said he couldn't stand being with an incapable wife and wanted to have grandchildren for his parents as soon as possible. Kayla stood firm against the woman's harsh words. Justin and Ashley were very close. They went on dates every week. He wouldn't say something like that. That was all an act. He was always complaining to me. There's no doubt about it. Weekly dates with his wife were fake. He was with me every night. And that's when you got pregnant with his child? Yes. So. That's how it is. Kayla began to tremble like I had earlier. To an outsider, Kayla's bowed head might look like she had accepted defeat. Oh my, are those tears of joy for finally having a grandchild? I suppose, since this woman couldn't give you one. But rejoice. You can finally hold your grandchild. Now, make sure to give us plenty of money for the child's sake. Her words made me bow my head and shake with emotion. The woman looked down at us with a triumphant smile. Just then, a man rushed into the scene, looking flustered. It was Justin's boss, who was also the woman's superior. What on earth are you thinking? The boss sternly reprimanded Elizabeth. Stay out of this. I had a relationship with Justin. I'm entitled to a share of the inheritance. Even if that's true, you need to understand the appropriate time and place. You have no right to interfere. I had a relationship with him. My claim to the inheritance is legitimate. Even if that's true, know your place. Shut up. I don't care anymore. Once I get the inheritance, I'm quitting the company. I won't even need maternity leave. I'm done with all of you, so stop complaining and just shut up. Her defiant attitude left the boss visibly shocked. I couldn't take it anymore. Neither could Kayla. I was trembling unable to stop the laughter from escaping. This is too much. Ha <laughs> ha. It's hilarious. Ashley, your laughter is contagious. Now I can't hold it in either. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Kayla and I finally burst into laughter, clutching our stomachs in a fit of uncontrollable giggles. Our loud laughter echoed through the somber funeral hall. Inappropriate as it was, but really. I've never heard such a joke in my life. Exactly. Justin doing that? No way. The other attendees stared at us in disbelief as we continued laughing. Stop laughing. Stop it, stop it, stop it. I'm not saying anything ridiculous. Elizabeth glared at us with furious eyes. In that chaotic moment, Kayla was the first to stop laughing. Listen, I don't know why you're spouting such lies. It's not a lie. He's the father of my child. Enough with the nonsense. Kayla's powerful voice silenced the entire room. Clearing her throat, Kayla fixed her gaze on Elizabeth. Listen, my son, he's a huge fan of Ashley. He loves her so much that he cried his eyes out and was a snotty mess when his proposal was accepted. Huh? Elizabeth looked bewildered by Kayla's unexpected words. It's true. Justin loved me deeply. Whenever we visited his family, he would constantly talk about our relationship, so much so that Kayla once hit him with a slipper to shut him up. Justin having an affair? A child with another woman? No way, no way. Absolutely not. Not in a million years. And besides, 
a decisive fact that proved she was lying. I stepped forward, determined, and faced Elizabeth. Look, this isn't something to discuss publicly, but if you're going to insist on this lie, I'll tell you. The reason we don't have children is because of Justin. What? Elizabeth was stunned into silence, unable to comprehend my words. I continued quietly. We knew before we got married. Justin had a childhood illness that made it impossible for him to father children. We discussed it and decided to live our lives as a couple without kids. Both our families knew this. They respected our decision and supported us. That can't be. If you still insist, we can do a DNA test on the child. But he's dead, how can we? It might be tricky, but it can be done with his hair, is that okay? Besides, it's medically proven that Justin couldn't have children. At that moment, two women who were Justin's colleagues grabbed Elizabeth's arms firmly. We deeply apologize for disrupting this important funeral. We will make a formal apology later. For now, we will take responsibility and escort her out. Wait a minute. I still have more to say. No, you don't. We're leaving now. Where's your family home? What, my family home? No, please don't. No complaints. No. In no time, Elizabeth was escorted out. The funeral proceeded without further incident. Back home, I finally took a breath, drinking coffee in front of Justin's photo. In the picture, Justin smiled at me. With the same gentle smile he had in life. I'm home, Justin. After a while, Justin's boss and colleagues came to apologize one after another. They apologized so deeply that I felt overwhelmed. I later heard that it was a shocking story. Apparently, Elizabeth was having an affair with another supervisor. Justin happened to find out about it, and since he detested such affairs, it troubled him deeply. He always thought that he didn't want me to hear such dirty stories. So he couldn't tell me and was troubled, looking unwell. That woman, the other supervisor had a family, and she thought it would be difficult to take him away from his wife. But she was worried about raising the baby alone, so she took advantage of Justin's misfortune, who was always vocal about his dislike for infidelity. Elizabeth was interrogated strictly by the company officials and her parents, and she revealed the truth. It's truly an outrageous story. What happened after that, you ask? Elizabeth's actions were almost like fraud, and it also damaged Justin's honor. Through discussions with Elizabeth's parents and a lawyer, they agreed to pay compensation. The baby to be born is innocent. Elizabeth's parents will raise the child, and she is now working under her parents' strict supervision to repay the compensation they covered. By the way, the company fired both the supervisor and her for compliance violations. As for me, I live each day busy, cherishing my memories with Justin. Tears still come unexpectedly, but at such times, I talk to Justin's photo. Then, strangely enough, I feel at peace. I'm sure he is watching over me from heaven. I can't join him yet, but I will bring a lot of stories to share. So, please wait for me until that day, Justin. I couldn't help but smile from ear to ear as my daughter-in-law, Melissa, and grandson, Eric, came to visit me in the hospital after I had fallen ill. After exchanging greetings, I tilted my head in confusion at Melissa's gloomy expression and the fact that she didn't bring the novel I had asked for during the visit. While averting her eyes unnaturally, Melissa seemed to muster up the courage to tell me something as she opened her mouth to speak. However, just as she was about to say something, Eric energetically leaped onto my hospital bed with his small body. Granny, will you get better after the surgery? Huh? Oh, it's really not a big deal. I guess I was just a little tired. Seeing your face, Eric, has completely rejuvenated me. 
As I smiled and made a gesture as if flexing my biceps, Eric, who saw this, also grinned happily. He peered into my face for a while and suddenly fell silent. I continued to smile while being gazed at by my grandson's beautiful eyes, which seemed to be deep in thought about something. Hey, Granny. Do adults laugh when they're lonely? What? Why do you ask? As I tried to ask him for his reason, Melissa hurriedly took out her wallet from her bag. She gently lowered Eric from my bed, handed him some change, and said, Go buy yourself some juice. Sending him out of the hospital room. Then, with a serious look on her face, she came close to my side and began to recount the event she had just witnessed. My name is Allison. My husband, Robert, and I are both in our fifties, and we are known by ourselves and others as a loving couple who have never had a fight since we were young. I am a self-proclaimed freelance writer who writes travel-related articles. For some reason, I have always admired the sound of the title freelance writer, so I search for work online, accept assignments, and am now passionately weaving my words. Robert works for an online gaming company, handling tasks such as system construction, but his job is very demanding, and it is not uncommon for him to stay overnight at the company when a deadline is approaching. Our son and his wife live in the neighborhood, and we have a very good relationship with them. Our son William and his wife Melissa often invite us on overnight trips and plan other activities. When our grandson Eric says things like, I have fun when I'm with Grandpa and Granny. I can't help but smile. However, Robert always declines invitations from our son and his wife, saying he is too busy with work, which is very disappointing for both him and me. Although Robert and I have a married life where we rarely have the opportunity to sit at the dinner table together, I am deeply grateful to my husband for working late into the night for our family. While my husband works diligently from early morning to late at night, I am not bound by time and freely pursue my freelance writing. When I have spare time, I feel really guilty about going on leisure trips with my son and his wife. Perhaps sensing my feelings, Robert always smiles with deep wrinkles etched on his face, as if a grin is carved into it. My work is like a hobby to me. You don't need to worry about it, Robert assured me with a smile. Yeah. Thank you, always, I replied gratefully. So, where are you traveling to next, he asked, curiosity piqued. Well, next is a tourist spot that has recently seen an increase in visitors. I began to explain. Robert listened to my conversation with a smile, nodding and interjecting appropriately. Occasionally, he would widen his eyes in surprise or nod deeply as if impressed, demonstrating his excellent listening skills. Wouldn't it be a great honor if someone read my travel article and visited the places I recommended? I spoke passionately. Whenever I talked with such enthusiasm, Robert's cheeks would relax into a happy expression. One day, while I was writing an article on my computer in my room, my fingers suddenly stopped touching the keyboard. I felt like I was making more mistakes than usual. My body felt feverish, as if the air conditioner's temperature setting was too high, and I continued writing the article while taking deep breaths, but eventually, my fingers came to a halt. From past experience, I knew. I had a fever. I reread the text on the computer screen and let out a big sigh. I had a deadline for the requested article, and I couldn't just sleep because I had a fever. I forced myself to finish writing the article, but as soon as I was done, my body felt heavy, and I collapsed from the chair. Apparently, I had lost consciousness for a while. My son's family, who had come to share some dinner, found it suspicious when I didn't answer the doorbell. Melissa, who had previously been given a spare key, had the presence of mind to enter the house and found me collapsed on the floor. Then, my son and his wife took me to the hospital. It seemed that overexerting myself while having a fever had taken its toll, 
and I was diagnosed with transient fatigue. I also had a strong headache, so on the doctor's recommendation, I was admitted to the hospital for about three days. When I contacted Robert, he said he had finished work and returned home, but he was worried when he couldn't find me. He promptly brought me three days' worth of clothes. Robert bowed his head, his voice filled with sincere apologies. He said that he was busy with work now and wouldn't be able to visit the hospital until the day I was discharged. It couldn't be helped if it was for work. With a smile, don't worry about it. I told him. The day after I was hospitalized, my fever had gone down and I was feeling much better. Sitting on the clean hospital bed, I restlessly looked up at the ceiling and opened the drawers of the TV stand. It should be fine to take a little walk, right? I convinced myself. I took a stroll around the hospital and sat down on a small chair in an area with an adjoining shop and restaurant. Ah, I'm so bored. I noticed a man sitting a short distance away, reading a book while placing an four stand beside him. Oh, come to think of it, I had an unfinished novel at home. William is probably not at home due to work, so should I call Melissa and ask her to bring the novel from my house? I gave her a spare key, and it's easy to explain where the book I was reading is located. I called Melissa from the public phone installed in the hospital, and she readily agreed. Then, I returned to my hospital room and started reading a picture book that was placed in the ward. It was a book called Where's Waldo? I casually opened the first page and seriously searched for Waldo, only to realize that two hours had passed. Melissa came to visit me, and I looked up from the picture book. Feeling a strange sense of guilt, as if I had wasted my time in the most unproductive way possible in my life, I put the picture book back and smiled at Melissa and Eric. Thank you for going out of your way, Melissa. After greeting her, I tilted my head in puzzlement at her gloomy expression and the fact that she didn't have the novel I had requested. While averting her eyes unnaturally, Melissa eventually seemed to muster up the courage to tell me something as she opened her mouth to speak. However, just as she was about to say something, my grandson Eric energetically leaped onto my bed with his small body. Granny, will you get better after the surgery? Huh? Oh, it's really not a big deal. I guess I was just a little tired. Seeing your face, Eric, has completely rejuvenated me. As I smiled and made a gesture as if flexing my biceps, Eric, who saw this, also grinned happily. He peered into my face for a while and suddenly fell silent. I continued to smile while being gazed at by my grandson's beautiful eyes, which seemed to be deep in thought about something. Hey, Granny. Do adults laugh when they're lonely? What? Why do you ask? Because, you know, when I went to Grandpa's house earlier, Grandpa was having a party with an unfamiliar lady. Even though you're in the hospital, Grandpa seemed to be having fun. I see. Grandpa is so sneaky. Having a party when you're not around. I saw it. They were drinking really fancy food and delicious looking juice at home. I didn't know how to respond to Eric's confession. Unable to come up with a clever retort and trying not to let it show that I was clearly at a loss for words, I realized that the smile I had desperately put on was strained. Melissa lifted Eric off my bed, took some change out of her wallet, and said, Go buy yourself some juice. Sending him out of the hospital room. Then, with a solemn expression, she came close to my side and began to recount the event she had just witnessed. Melissa and Eric had apparently entered my house using the spare key, as per my request. Since it was a weekday afternoon, they thought no one would be home and entered the house without much thought. However, they found neatly arranged women's luggage in the entryway, and they could faintly hear Robert's laughter coming from the living room. Thinking, oh? Is he off work today, they approached the living room. 
Melissa thought he might be watching TV and laughing. However, through the slightly open gap in the living room door, they saw Robert sitting on the sofa next to an unfamiliar woman. Moreover, the woman was apparently leaning her body against his arm, whispering something faintly into his ear. Melissa instinctively scooped up Eric and left the house as is. On the way here, Eric asked me why we didn't say hello. I blurted out that Grandpa is forcing himself because Granny is not feeling well and he's lonely. I made up an excuse that I didn't even understand myself. Melissa apologized to me, looking thoroughly remorseful. I quickly said to her, It's okay, don't worry about it. I'm sorry. Then, Eric returned to the hospital room with a happy face, holding a juice. Eric spent time on my bed, chatting about trivial things and laughing cheerfully. Melissa watched this with a complicated expression, but I told her in a small voice. I'll be fine. After the two of them left the hospital room, I opened Where's Waldo in the suddenly quiet room. It's not that I particularly wanted to read it. It's not that I wanted to find Waldo, but I wanted to somehow sort out the indescribable feelings welling up in my heart. As I stared at the many people depicted in the picture book, my vision gradually blurred with tears and I could no longer see anything. Three days after being hospitalized, I was safely discharged. Robert, who managed to find time in his busy work schedule to pick me up on the day of my discharge, spent time with me with his usual gentle smile, so I spent the day as I always did. On weekday mornings, I make breakfast for him as usual and see him off at the entrance as usual. It's the start of the same daily routine as always, but beneath the surface of that life, my plan was beginning to take shape. The catalyst for the plan was William. He must have heard from Melissa that Robert might be cheating. He came while I was in the hospital and quietly expressed his anger. Let's perplex Dad. I leaned forward with keen interest at my son's suggestion. Rather than being angry about being cheated on, I might have just wanted to confront him with the fact of his infidelity and fluster him. With William's cooperation, the plan to capture Robert's cheating scene properly was quietly underway. First, William consulted with a lawyer and hired a private investigator, resulting in obtaining photos of the cheating scene in a short period. In a detective agency located in a rental building in the bustling district, a dubious-looking elderly man handed me a file summarizing the investigation results. In the photos, Robert had his usual gentle smile, walking happily through town with a woman I didn't know. I had obtained that decisive evidence, but for some reason, I couldn't bring myself to blame him. I was certainly sad about being cheated on, but it's a fact that he has been working hard to earn money for the family. Is it right to focus on the infidelity part alone, neglecting the gratitude for that and putting the spotlight on our marriage up until now? If I confront him with the results of the infidelity investigation, and if it leads to divorce, what will happen to my life now? After leaving the office, I stood still in the crowded downtown area, feeling as if I had become lost. Even if I condemn my husband with the results of this infidelity investigation, what will happen to my life? With such uncertainty looming over me, I sit in front of my computer in the living room at home. My work as a writer consisted of small articles and columns, but perhaps because I had been doing it for a long time and gained trust, the requests never ceased. However, when I reread the completed articles and columns, I let out a big sigh. I don't think I have talent as a writer. I used to be good at weaving words together and creating works that touched readers' hearts. But lately, I feel like something is missing. I reread my past works and became anxious, wondering if my talent had disappeared somewhere. Am I emotionally weakened because my husband cheated on me? Even as I asked myself this question, I couldn't help but shake my head. It's not that I have changed. Surely, in the creative process, hardships and setbacks are necessary. 
When I first started working as a writer, it was so much fun. I was thrilled beyond words to put my thoughts into writing and have someone read them. Such enjoyable times can't last forever, and sometimes stagnation and trials will come. As I was pondering such thoughts, the house phone rang. It was from the detective I had hired for the infidelity investigation. I only vaguely remembered his face, but I recalled that he seemed suspicious. He quickly got to the point after a brief greeting. Did you read the last line? The detective said. Um. I didn't read it very carefully. Since my assignment this time was an infidelity investigation, I thought it was unnecessary. But I happened to find an interesting fact. If you didn't know, Allison, I thought William wouldn't know either, so I casually included it in the document. I see. Given my profession, I've done a lot of infidelity investigations. You may not know this, but the behavior patterns of cheating men are almost always the same. I guess their brain structures are the same. But you know. I could tell the detective was laughing happily over the phone. Your husband's behavior was odd from the first day of the investigation. Normally, my job would be to capture the scene of infidelity in a photograph, and that's it. However, I talked to the lawyer, and since it's the 10th anniversary of the office's establishment, I decided to provide some extra service. After hanging up the phone, I looked through the infidelity investigation materials again. I carefully read the contents written there and took a deep breath. Why? Now, the words my grandson Eric said to me are deeply etched in my heart. With those clear eyes, without any doubt, he asked me a straightforward question. Why do adults laugh when they're lonely? One month later. I told Robert that I was going on a trip with my son's family and smiled at him as he saw me off at the entrance of our home. Pulling a carry-on bag that wasn't very full, I headed towards the station. Without any particular destination in mind, I simply let myself be swayed by the train, gazing at the scenery visible from the window. When Robert and I were young, we always took the train for our dates. Until we got married, we didn't own a car and always met up at a coffee shop in front of the station that offered specialty teas. On the menu, the names of the tea leaves, such as candy and dimbula, were meticulously listed one by one. We always arrived 30 minutes before the appointed time, and Robert always drank mallow tea. Mallow is a hollyhock flower. When a thin slice of lemon placed beside the blue tea, the color of a southern sea, brewed in a heat-resistant glass, is lightly squeezed, it magically turns the tea pink. I quietly watched this sight. It's beautiful. He murmured, not referring to the beautifully colored mallow tea, but quietly gazing at me. I couldn't help but give a wry smile at his usual cliché line. Thinking about it now, we were a foolish couple, but I was certainly happy back then. Even though I should be frustrated and angry about Robert cheating on me, for some reason, what I remember is the mallow tea that Robert always drank back then. Without giving it much thought, I entered a random coffee shop. There was no mallow tea on the menu. I chose a menu item labeled black tea, without the names of the tea leaves listed, and as I sat down, I let my gaze wander over the strings of characters printed in the book I had brought which my mind could hardly recognize as sentences at this point. For a long time. I spent my time like that. Feeling uncomfortable staying in the same coffee shop for too long, I hopped to two more coffee shops. Those shops didn't offer mallow tea either. I just wandered aimlessly, walking around the city, entering coffee shops that caught my eye and I felt a little disappointed when I unconsciously searched for that name in the menu items and couldn't find it. The mallow tea in my memories was starting to become a vague color in my recollection. As night fell, I returned home. I inserted the key into the keyhole as usual and headed towards the living room as usual. Sure enough, 
there were Robert and a woman. The two of them were speechless. They were frozen in surprise, as if time had stopped. Quiet classical music flowed from the built-in speakers, and there were stylish hors d'oeuvres placed on the table. Warm steam rose from the blue mallow tea that the two of them were about to drink, having apparently finished their meal. I didn't utter a word. Robert didn't try to speak either. The gentle tones of the music spread throughout the living room, and a strange moment passed where we simply stared at each other. Eventually, William came in, making a rough noise, and when he spotted Robert, he let out an exaggerated sigh. Behind William, Melissa was also peeking in with an anxious expression. Hey, hey! What kind of party is this? You don't mind if we join in too, right? Wait a minute. What are you trying to do, all of a sudden? As Robert stood up from the sofa, the woman next to him timidly grabbed his sleeve, looking frightened. She was a plain woman, about 12 years younger than me. She had unremarkable, delicate facial features. She wore light-colored jeans and a hoodie with a stretched-out neckline. Wearing hardly any makeup, she whispered in a reserved voice. That's not it. Um, our relationship is not what you all think it is. Oh, is that so? But we have evidence, like photos. William triumphantly held out the photos he had in front of the woman's face. They captured images of the two of them walking together looking close, dining together, and so on. The woman averted her gaze from the photos shown to her and smiled faintly with a lonely expression. I'm not very successful, but I'm a stage actress. That's right. She's an actress, and as part of her character development, I'm providing acting guidance to help her gain experience in infidelity. Don't get the wrong idea. Caught off guard by the unexpected words stage actress, William and Melissa looked at each other. The woman calmly explained the circumstances up to this point. She admitted that she and Robert had indeed dined alone together in this house. They had also engaged in behavior that simulated dating in the city. However, she insisted that it was all part of her character development as an actress, and Robert was simply cooperating with her. There was certainly no definitive evidence that Robert and the woman were in a romantic relationship. But when I asked why Robert had to cooperate with such a thing, the woman, who had seemed plain until now, suddenly looked at me with an alluring expression. That's because he was lonely, wasn't it? Lonely? Robert said that Allison is always going on trips and doesn't properly face him. He's busy with work, so he doesn't have time to be with her. I know that whenever I, who usually works remotely, mention going on a trip, Robert takes advantage of the opportunity to invite women over to our home and indulge himself. I also know that he told me he was staying at the company for work, but he was actually meeting with women. Everything Robert says about the company being busy is a complete lie. I know that he actually finishes work on time but spends his nights out late. I know that my kind husband's smiles are all lies. But if I denounce everything as a lie right here and now, everything will fall apart and disappear. Like a soap bubble, it will burst and vanish. The mallow tea I drank with him at the coffee shop was like magic, it was so beautiful. Have I been under a spell since I met him back then? If I were to leave this place now with a forced smile, saying something like, So that's how it was. I'm sorry for the misunderstanding. It would be like publicly acknowledging his infidelity. As I struggled to find the right words to say, Melissa put her arm around my shoulder from the side. Allison, it's okay. Don't hold back. When people are lonely or sad, they don't force themselves to smile. People who display the opposite emotions of what they feel are usually liars. At Melissa's words, which likely had no basis, I couldn't help but laugh. That's right. That's true. When people are lonely, they don't laugh. 
I can't imagine continuing to live with a husband who justifies his actions to fill the gaps in his heart because he's lonely and spends his days with a self-righteous smile. This is fine. All this time, I've been pretending to be fooled by Robert's kind smile. I've been playing the role of a foolish wife. Maybe I was deceiving myself, thinking that I couldn't go on living if I didn't do that. I had been a housewife for so long, dabbling in hobbies masquerading as jobs, that I had grown too accustomed to the lukewarm comfort of my life, almost forgetting what I truly wanted for myself. The future where I could earnestly write and publish articles about the things I discovered during my travels, and have someone read them, I should start considering that more seriously. Turning away from my always calm and kind husband, I knew I had to become independent. I could no longer believe his lies. Robert! I... I'm leaving you! I keep telling you, it's a misunderstanding. I'm just helping her rehearse her play. There's no evidence of an affair. And I can't afford any compensation. Sure, there might not be enough evidence for a lawsuit to demand compensation. But William and Melissa will support me. And I doubt our relatives will side with you given the circumstances. Robert gave a wry smile and ran a hand through his hair, as if admitting defeat. I suddenly produced the documents investigated by the detective, pointing to the relevant details. Robert's eyes followed my finger to the specified part, and his thin smile finally disappeared, his face turning pale. Although it wasn't related to the infidelity investigation, the detective had found that Robert's savings exceeded $1 million. You won the lottery a year ago. Congratulations. $1 million is quite something. Ah, uh, no. This, well. You've been leaving work on time every day and taking a lot of paid leave. Did you think having money would keep you safe if your affair was discovered? I glared harshly at the woman involved with him. Even in a normal divorce, I would get at least $500,000. If you don't admit to the affair, I'll spend whatever it takes to win in court. I. But if you admit to the affair now, I'll only claim compensation from him. After all, you were just after his money, weren't you? The woman hesitated for a moment, then nodded slightly, looking down. William and Melissa seemed unable to grasp the rapid turn of events. In short, I was leaving Robert, it's as simple as that. The divorce was finalized without incident, and compensation was paid. After the division of assets, he still had a considerable amount of money left, but having won the lottery, he lost motivation for his job and was taken off the promotion track. The woman who had continued seeing him for a while also broke up with him as his financial situation worsened. She probably never achieved much success as an actress, as her name never became well known. William and Melissa offered to let me live with them, but I thanked them and chose to rent an apartment and live alone. Are you sure you don't want to live with us? I have plenty of money now, and I'm going to travel freely and explore the country. I resolved to live my life to the fullest from now on. It's my life, after all. I don't want to live by watching someone else's expressions or ignoring lies I can see right through. From now on, I will express what I think clearly to those around me. Now, I'm enjoying my work as a travel writer, a dream I had given up on while doing housework and raising children. Every time I read replies and support emails from readers, or messages saying they traveled to the same places I did, my heart, once blue, transforms like mallow tea with a touch of lemon, clear and warm, with a hint of tartness. Taking care of dad and mom is all on you, my dear wife. If you oppose, I'll divorce you and sue for alimony, huh? Could he really believe such an absurd demand would pass? I looked at Georgina, utterly exasperated. Alex stood there boldly, giving me a nasty smirk while looking at me. He must think I would accept his demand. 
Indeed, I've complied with the requests for the sake of the in-laws, believing it was the right thing to do. Regardless of Alex, I thought those two were good people. But now, having seen Brittany's true nature, I've lost all concern, let alone any sympathy. I smiled back at Alex. All right then. Let's get a divorce. Don't come crying to me later. Talking back to your husband, what a failure of a wife. Good riddance. Choosing your job over dad and mom. Unbelievable. Oh, my apologies for that. Exactly. I'd prioritize dad and mom over my job any day. Unlike you, who's utterly heartless. Alex boasted too proudly. Then why didn't he take time off work now? Instead of pushing it onto me, he should just take a break and help out his parents. Blaming and pushing responsibilities onto me without lifting a finger, what a way to shift the blame. From now on, even if we see each other at work, don't you dare speak to me. Ah, I should have chosen a different company. Alex's parting words pushed me to my limit. Then you're fired. What? Fired? You're not my boss, what are you on about? Gone mad from the divorce shock? I couldn't help but reveal a truth Alex was unaware of. I'm Ren, 40 years old. I run an apparel company. I started this company at 26. Having lost my parents early, I motivated myself by setting goals and focusing on achieving them. Decades later, I've dedicated my life to stabilizing the business, working tirelessly. As my friends got married one by one, I didn't even have a boyfriend. There was no time to play. I traveled for work, both domestically and internationally. There were years I don't recall taking any time off. Surrounded by relatives and acquaintances, I was often met with veiled criticism disguised as concern. Aren't you going to run out of time to have children if you don't hurry up? Is work really that enjoyable for you? Don't you get lonely? Arguing back would only invite more nagging. So, I took to leaving those situations with a forced smile as quickly as possible. All the effort I poured into my life paid off, and the company's performance steadily improved. Finally, I could afford to take regular breaks and had the luxury to enjoy my personal life. By this time, I was already 38 years old. At this point, I wasn't particularly keen on marriage, but the idea of having a good partner was appealing. That's when I met my husband, Alex. Our meeting was sparked by a soccer game. Suggested by a subordinate, I went to watch a game on a whim and met Alex there, cheering for the same team, and we hit it off. After attending a few games together, we started going out, and then he asked me out. Alex was the same age as me, but seemed remarkably youthful. He had many hobbies, from baseball to video games, manga, and golf, dragging me along to all sorts of activities. Having never really had time to play before, my time with Alex was incredibly exciting and fun. Being my first boyfriend at 38, I was honestly quite thrilled. One day, Alex broached the subject. Would you meet my parents? Eh? If I'm going to marry someone, it's going to be Ren. That's why I want to properly introduce you to them. This was about two months into our relationship. Caught off guard, I couldn't refuse, always looking forward to the fun times with Alex. Things went smoothly, and a week later, we visited Alex's parents' house. Oh my! To be dating such a lovely person, my son is a lucky man. Indeed. What a wonderful young lady. And for Alex to introduce a girlfriend to us, that's a first. He must be really smitten. Warm and welcoming, Alex's parents showered me with compliments leaving me flattered and embarrassed throughout the visit. Alex, sitting next to me, smugly commented. Right? A catch at 38. Right? A catch at 38. 
Though crudely put, it seemed meant as a compliment in Alex's way. With such wonderful parents, I felt we could have a good relationship after marriage. I was relieved the meeting went well. However, I was slightly concerned that Alex referred to his parents as mom and dad. A calling I hadn't often heard from adult men in my circles, which initially surprised me. But considering the differences in each family, I decided not to dwell on it negatively. Alex seemed to have a good relationship with his parents, often praising his mother excessively. While endearing, some aspects felt off-putting at times. Like when the conversation turned to cooking. What kind of dishes do you excel at, Ren? I wouldn't say I excel, but I often cook Western-style meals. At this, Alex enthusiastically chimed in. Right. She makes steak a lot. They're edible but, when compared to mom's cooking. Oh, that's a great idea. Why don't you teach her your recipes? I understood the comfort of familiar tastes. But his wording left me feeling complex. Unperturbed by my feelings, Alex's mother was delighted. Well then. I must compile a notebook for Alex's sake. She was enjoying herself. As we were about to leave, a shocking truth came to light. When are you two getting married? Asked by Alex's mother. Alex casually replied, causing me to be taken aback. I'd marry her right now if I could. It'd make life easier, especially since part-time work doesn't pay much. Part-time? Indeed, when I first met Alex and inquired about his job, he vaguely mentioned. Something like sales. I too had been vague about my job, saying only. Something in apparel. As we were still just getting to know each other. Everyone has things they'd rather not discuss. I figured we could talk about it more once we got a bit closer. I had completely forgotten about it, never imagining he was working part-time. Stunned, Alex explained with a frustrated look. What's with that face? Thinking even at 38? But, you see, there's a good reason for this. Turns out, Alex's mother has always been frail and prone to sickness. Then, two years ago, his father fell ill and needed care. Alex, who was working in sales at a steel company at the time, quit to take care of his father switching to a more flexible part-time job. Mom alone would have a hard time, right? I just wanted to be there for my parents. I thought it'd be fine to stay part-time for that reason. Alex glanced at his parents and nodded. Recently, both mom and dad have been in good health, so I'm thinking of getting a full-time job again. I gotta work hard if I'm going to marry Ren. Hearing about the part-time work, I felt ashamed of my disappointment. Alex had simply prioritized his parents over his job. What a kind and warm person he is. And now, he's thinking of what's best for me. After our conversation, I thought for a moment and then made Alex an offer. If you're interested, why don't you apply to my company? Eh? Work at the same company as Ren? Yeah. It's a bit different, but you were in sales before, right? We're actually looking for sales staff right now. I met well with my suggestion, but Alex visibly grimaced. I'd rather work somewhere I can earn more. I want to make mom feel secure. Did he think I wasn't earning enough? I explained more about our company. Showing him job listings, I pointed out the salary and holidays along with other benefits. Alex, who had been skeptically browsing the site, gradually warmed up to the idea. This might not be too bad after all. And so, he applied to a position at my company. Fortunately, we were looking to significantly expand our sales department, so Georgina was hired. Pressured somewhat by his parents, we registered our marriage. Who would have thought we'd end up working at the same company? Indeed. By the way, 
Which department are you in? It seems Alex still thought of it as just the company I work for, not realizing I'm the owner. I hadn't kept it a secret on purpose, but it felt awkward to bring it up, and I hadn't mentioned it yet. This seemed like a good opportunity, so, with a nervous heart, I was about to reveal the truth. Actually. Alex cut me off with an unexpected remark. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll probably quit eventually anyway. Eh? Quit. What did he mean by that? A bad feeling washed over me. Alex glanced at me and laughed, a smile I hadn't seen before. It scared me. What? You got a problem? Uh. No, it's not a complaint, but what do you mean? I'm not planning to quit my job now. Oh, unless we have kids? But, my company offers maternity and paternity leave. Kids are out of the question. We're already busy with dad and mom. Dad and mom? As I tilted my head, Alex mimicked me mockingly. Yeah, my parents. Didn't I say they need care? Rosalind? I heard, but you said they've been doing well lately. That's why you re-entered the workforce, right? Even if they're doing well, they're still elderly, aren't they? Aren't you worried at all? Or what? As a wife, are you planning to shirk that responsibility? I couldn't grasp what Alex was trying to say, feeling bewildered. I needed to clear my head and sort things out. Alex was trying to push the responsibility of caregiving onto me. And from how he spoke, it seemed he eventually planned to have me quit my job to prioritize caregiving. I'm not saying you should quit right away. Having two incomes helps financially. For now, just come back to the family home with me on our days off. What is that supposed to mean? I wasn't completely unprepared for the caregiving conversation. I had intended to help out, and I had thought that I could be of assistance in the future. But I never imagined being expected to return to my in-law's house every holiday, eventually being burdened with caregiving responsibilities. What surprised me most was Alex's attitude. Before marriage, he was positive and reliable, but he changed drastically as soon as we got married. Is this person really Alex? I didn't want to believe it. This isn't the person I wanted to marry. I wanted to escape from reality by closing my eyes tightly, but Alex's angry voice relentlessly broke through. Listen, you're my wife. Don't defy me. Got it? I was so shocked by the change that I couldn't agree or disagree. I wish I hadn't married at all if I knew this would happen. Regret filled my mind, and the word divorce quickly followed. Society might frown upon a divorce so soon after getting married. But that seemed less important than wasting time with someone unpleasant. I prepared the divorce papers right away. The issue was the reason for divorce and the in-laws. The reason for divorce could be managed somehow. If necessary, I could even involve a lawyer. But the in-laws were a bigger concern. As Alex declared, we started visiting his parents' house on our days off. I was reluctant to go because Alex treated me poorly. But his parents were overjoyed every time we visited. I'm sorry for making you come here on your day off. No, it's okay. Brittany, teary-eyed with joy, made it impossible for me to rudely decline their hospitality. Every visit, they prepared my favorite sweets, telling me how much they appreciated it. Though I disliked being controlled by Alex, seeing Brittany happy made it difficult to bring up divorce, and time passed. By two months into our marriage, Georgina and I had started visiting his family home separately. Our days off just didn't align anymore. Initially, I had forced myself to adjust to Alex's schedule. Meanwhile, I had kept it a secret that I was the president of the company. The Alex before our marriage might have been fine, 
but revealing this to the current Alex would only invite trouble. Although it would be easy to find out if he looked into it, luckily, Alex seemed oblivious. Alex was a source of concern both as a husband and as an employee, causing numerous problems at work. I wanted to resolve the issues at work quickly and get a divorce. But what about Brittany? Despite everything, I didn't want to upset them. Torn, I headed to my in-law's house as usual. Lately, I had become accustomed to entering the house without waiting to be invited. Today, as always, I opened the door and took off my shoes. That's when I heard a familiar voice from the back. Undoubtedly, it was Alex's voice. He was supposed to work today, but perhaps his schedule had changed. Feeling awkward, I walked down the hall and was about to enter the living room when I overheard their conversation. That person, she's not very considerate, is she? And her housekeeping is subpar. She's earnest, but couldn't you find someone better? Indeed, it was Brittany's voice. However, the tone was so full of malice, unlike anything I had heard from her before. It sounded like something out of a movie, so spiteful and unlike the Brittany I knew. Yet, it was unmistakably Brittany's voice. Despite all the praise she had given me. The thought of the gentle Brittany saying such things tightened my chest. I didn't want to hear any more, but my legs felt too heavy to move. Sorry, mom. But, you know, she's tall, so she might be able to carry you if necessary. With a bit of training, she could become more useful. Well, for now, she's pleasant and financially supportive, so I suppose that's acceptable. We're hoping for potential, I guess. Alex and Brittany were laughing carelessly as they spoke. As I listened, my heart pounded with the realization that they were talking about me. Georgina's constant complaints were one thing, but I was shocked to discover Brittany's hidden side. Brittany, who always seemed so grateful, who would lower their head in thanks repeatedly, making me feel almost guilty. We shared laughs over snacks and meals I had cooked. Regardless of Alex's intentions, I thought I had a good relationship with Brittany. I had hesitated on divorce partly because of Brittany. Yet, according to their conversation, I was merely a caregiving resource for Brittany as well. Brittany then added insult to injury with this remark. For now, I'll keep praising her and egging her on. She looks so foolishly happy then. Alex, you should learn from me. A fool and his scissors are easily parted, as they say. Hearing this, I left the house as if fleeing. After calming myself down a bit, I contacted Alex and his family. I'm going to be busy for a while and won't be able to visit or contact you. I'll reach out again later. Despite multiple calls from both Alex and his family, I ignored them all. Alex's angry messages were even recorded on the voicemail. Do you think you can trouble mom like this? Apologize to her in person right now. You don't have the right to refuse. As if anyone would comply after being spoken to like that. Naturally, I ignored this too. At work, I made sure not to run into Alex and started staying at a hotel after hours. During this time, I methodically prepared for divorce. Then, one day when preparations were sufficiently in place, I was finally caught by Georgina, who had been lying in wait at the office. Hey! Ren! Upon spotting me, Georgina looked like he was about to grab me but restrained himself, likely due to the presence of others. I decided to move the conversation to an empty conference room to talk with Alex. I've been looking for you. What do you think you're doing? How many times have I called you? Do you have any idea how much I've been searching for you? Alex was clearly furious. His breath was heavy, and his eyes, bloodshot and glaring, seemed to curse me with every look. As soon as we entered the room, he approached me with heavy footsteps. 
Then, standing right in front of me, he aggressively grabbed my wrist. Let go! I told you on the phone, didn't I? I'll contact you when I've calmed down. Is there anything more important to you than my dad and mom? Do you realize how lonely you've made them feel by not being there? Lonely? They were talking behind my back, and yet he dares to complain. I trembled with anger. I wished I could shut him up right there. And hurl at him the worst insults I could think of. But I was too agitated to articulate my thoughts properly, so all I could do was grit my teeth and glare at Alex. Taking advantage of my silence, Alex continued. Poor them, right? Even now, they're hungry because there's no food at home. Ah, uh, forget work today, you should just go back home. Don't you dare tell me what to do with my work. You're not a child, and caregiving doesn't mean you can't move. It's about time you stopped being so dependent. I shook off Alex's hand and yelled. I have an important meeting later today. There's no way I can just take off. And if it's so important, you should take a day off and go yourself. There was no need for me to sacrifice so much for such people. Throwing away important work for them? Alex probably never expected me to fight back. He staggered back, surprised. You, you're talking back to me. A wife's place is too. I've been thinking, your values are skewed. What do you mean a wife's place? They're your parents, aren't they? Shouldn't you be taking care of them instead of pushing it onto someone else? Indeed, Alex's work today was supposed to be just preparing documents and meetings in the office. The document preparation could be rescheduled, and the meetings could be rearranged if he asked others, without causing much inconvenience. If Brittany was so important, he should be the one to take time off. If he won't, it shows how little they matter to him. Yet he dares to blame and try to control me. Such a convenient mama's boy. Disgusting. What? That's ridiculous. Why should I, the husband, have to bow my head and skip work just to clean up after my wife? Clean up what exactly? It's time to make things clear. Listen up. Taking care of my parents is your job as my wife. If you can't do that, you're worthless as a wife. Alex launched into a tirade, puffing up his chest with rough breaths. As if trying to intimidate me. Was he trying to scare me? He seemed like some playground bully. Not scary at all. What even is the value of a wife? Why do I have to be evaluated? So, what exactly do you want from me? I asked, my voice laced with a sigh. Alex snorted derisively. Taking care of dad and mom is all on you, my dear wife. If you oppose, I'll divorce you and sue for alimony, huh? Could he seriously believe such an absurd demand would fly? I looked at Alex, utterly dumbfounded, but there he was, standing tall and proud, giving me a nasty smirk. He must think I'd comply with his demand after becoming attached to Brittany. Indeed, I had been accommodating to the in-laws, thinking it was for the best. Regardless of Alex, I thought those two were good people. But now, having seen Brittany's true colors, I couldn't care less, let alone feel any sympathy. I smiled back at Alex. All right then. Let's get a divorce. Huh? Alex sounded completely taken aback. Do you even understand what you're saying? Yes. I can't be the wife you want. So, let's get a divorce, shall we? If you want to sue for alimony, go ahead. Whether you'll get it is another matter, though. I pulled out the divorce papers from my bag and handed them to Georgina. I had been keeping them on hand ever since I considered divorce. Are you serious? Do you realize what you're doing? Yes. Please, sign them quickly. 
Alex froze, seemingly in disbelief. Seeing his hesitation, I said, Oh, you're not divorcing? Just talk, then? Which made him furiously scribble his signature on the papers. After reviewing the signed document, everything was in order. I immediately handed it over to my secretary to file. Well, we're strangers now. As I stated matter-of-factly, Alex spat out. You'll regret this. Talking back to your husband, what a failure of a wife. Good riddance. Choosing your job over dad and mom. Unbelievable. Oh, my apologies for that. Exactly. Even if I lost my job, I'd prioritize dad and mom. I'm not heartless like you. Alex said this with too much pride. Then why didn't he take time off now? Instead of pushing it onto me, he should just take a break and help out his parents. Blaming me while he just complains is just passing the buck. From now on, even if we see each other at work, don't talk to me. Ah, I should have chosen a different company. Alex's parting shot pushed me to my limit. Then you're fired. I believe it was the coldest voice I've ever used. Alex stopped in his tracks and turned around and puzzled. Huh? Dismissed? You're not my boss. Have you gone mad from the divorce shock? Alex laughed. Perhaps thinking it was a joke. I sighed softly and fixed my gaze on Georgina. When our eyes met, Alex flinched, looking at me. Anxiously, bracing for what was to come. I inhaled deeply and spoke calmly. The funny one is you. You don't even recognize the face of your own company's president? Huh? No, that can't be. Alex's mouth twitched as he pulled out his smartphone and started searching. As he stared at the screen, the color drained from his face. He must have finally realized who I was. You're the president of this company? Finally caught on, have you? Alex knelt down and bowed his head to me. His voice trembling pitifully. It's not like that, Ren. I didn't know. Not know? No, you chose not to know, didn't you? I never brought it up, but there were plenty of opportunities for him to find out. A simple search on his phone would have revealed my name, if not my photo. It was typical of Alex. He probably never had any interest. A man without particular concern for the content of his work. Focusing solely on income and time off. That's why his work performance has always been subpar. To you, I was merely an afterthought, wasn't I? What you and your parents truly desired was a diligent, hardworking wife. Someone to take care of them, anyone would do, right? Alex, mouth agape, shook his head. His face turning a ghastly shade of pale. Not at all. Had I known you were the president, I would never have expected you to shoulder the caregiving. I would have taken care of dad and mom myself, allowing you to concentrate on your work. With sufficient funds, one could easily hire assistants. You'd have me earn while outsourcing caregiving to professionals, and you'd merely enjoy life, right? Alex, with a faint smile, whispered, I wouldn't do something so terrible. Indeed. Had Alex navigated things more adeptly, such a future might have been attainable. Had he proposed this before I discovered his parents' true nature, I would have agreed without hesitation. I'll earn so you can dedicate yourself to caregiving. I believe he would have sincerely said that. If Alex and his parents not shown their true colors after marriage, such a future could have been plausible. He squandered that opportunity by his own doing. Alex looked up at me, eyes seemingly moist, with a plea. Please, Ren! Can't we start over? We had good times, didn't we? Let's visit all those places again. True, you always took me to places I never knew. 
Every place you took me was indeed fun. A glimmer of hope shone in Alex's face. Right? So, if that's the case. However, that was merely you donning a mask to get married. Life with you post-marriage was profoundly disappointing. That is. I wonder if the divorce papers have been processed by now. Well, I must prepare for a meeting. Regarding the dismissal, I'll contact you later. You may leave for today. I packed my belongings, waved flippantly at Alex, and reached for the door. But before I could open it, Alex grasped my left hand. Turning around, I faced Alex's glare. I glared back and simply asked, Anything else? Anything else? This isn't over. Suddenly deciding on a divorce, then revealing you're the president, and now a dismissal. I can't just accept this. It's all too arbitrary on your part. The divorce was initiated by you. You didn't expect me to agree to it. Moreover, you should have properly informed me that you were the president. It appears Alex had planned to use the divorce as leverage to control me. The revelation of my presidency must have been a shock to him. Blaming others and shirking responsibility onto his wife. Such actions are unbecoming of an adult. It's absurd that I had to set everything up for him, yet he never questioned it. He's always lived by blaming others. I'm at a loss for words from sheer disbelief. Alex is grinding his back teeth, seemingly regretting letting go of his financial support, but that's not my concern. Isn't that too self-serving? Blaming me for your lack of planning and ignorance isn't fair. I said, causing Alex's face to flush red as he yelled back in a strained voice. Coward! How can the president of such a large company justify firing an employee for personal gain? That's unacceptable. Such tyranny won't be tolerated. Alex postured as if he had the moral high ground. His thinking is too immature. Always believing he's in the right. Can he not comprehend what's been said? I couldn't help but hold my head in my hands. Seeing me like this, Alex, thinking he had one, smirked triumphantly. See? I hit the nail on the head. Should I bring this to light? You'd be the one in trouble. I'm astounded by your foolishness. If it comes out, you're the one who'll suffer. What are you talking about, I'm? I cut Alex off, listing names. General Affairs Hoyt, Sales Gracelyn, Winter, and Accountings Paisley. Who else was there? When I asked Alex, he began sweating profusely and looking away. What? What are you talking about? You know very well. I just named female employees you've been persistently harassing. They've come to me seeking help. Most employees don't know Alex is my husband. Only my secretary is aware. Among them, I received complaints like, I'm troubled by the constant invitations from sales Alex. At first, I doubted my ears. My own husband was hitting on multiple young female employees. And despite their rejections, he kept coming back. I was mortified and apologetic beyond words. I was just trying to foster camaraderie among employees. Alex defended. By specifically targeting women over a decade younger than you? And inviting them to hotels? What kind of camaraderie were you trying to build? There were messages sent from Alex to these women, undeniable proof. No matter what Alex said, there was no escaping it. You're not only underperforming, but you're also a nuisance to others. It's my job as president to remove those who are detrimental to the company, isn't it? But. That's right. And from accounting, there's a report that you might be fudging expenses. What about that? Surely, you wouldn't stoop so low, would you? Alex averted his eyes and fell silent. 
Regrettably, it seems that was true as well. A mama's boy, a womanizer, and on top of that, a miser. Moreover, to think he caused trouble not just for me but for others too, it's disappointing not just as a husband but as a person. I'm disillusioned by my lack of judgment in not seeing him for what he was. Feeling inept for not having seen through such a person. I'll make sure all suspicions are cleared up before proceeding with the dismissal, so rest assured. Well, I'm leaving now. You better get along with your parents back home. Alex collapsed on the spot. Slumped over, muttering something under his breath. He must have realized it was all too late. Even as I reached for the door, Alex, now devoid of energy, didn't say anything more, and I left the room. Upon further investigation, all suspicions against Alex were confirmed. After making Alex apologize to the affected female employees, he resigned voluntarily, taking responsibility. Now jobless, Alex returned to live with his parents at home. A while later, he attempted to start working again part-time, but then something unexpected happened to Alex. Until now, though former Rosalind needed care, former Brittany was essentially able to manage daily tasks on her own. Thanks to this, Alex only had to help out occasionally. However, former Brittany has recently started showing signs of dementia, including instances of wandering at night. A father who physically requires care and a mother who is usually fine but occasionally shows symptoms of dementia. I just can't find peace anymore. We're running out of money too. Please help. I received a plea for help from Alex, indicating he was at his limit. If our divorce had been amicable and there were no hard feelings towards my former in-laws, I might have been inclined to help. But these were the people who had looked down on me as nothing more than a caregiver. There's no room for sympathy. It sounds tough, but I'm afraid I cannot offer any assistance. Furthermore, as we are now strangers, I kindly ask that you refrain from contacting me further. Depending on the situation, I may have to take appropriate actions. After conveying this, I no longer received any messages from Alex. After divorcing Alex, I had decided I was done with marriage and resolved to live alone. However, just when I had settled on this, someone I had known for many years through work confessed his feelings to me. The trauma from Alex made me consider declining, but knowing this person's sincerity from our long acquaintance, I gratefully accepted the offer to start dating. Whether this will lead to marriage, I'm uncertain, and part of me doubts, fearing a change post-marriage, but this person is the most gentle individual I've ever met. Moreover, since he is also a business owner, we can share and understand each other's work. Unlike with Alex, he truly feels like a partner should. If I can spend the future with him, this happiness I feel now will surely continue. Hoping for such a future, I continue to work hard today. I have no intention of taking Joe in. Just put him in some facility or something. Emma, the ex-wife of my recently deceased husband, screamed this to the surrounding relatives, as I still couldn't grasp the reality of losing my husband to a heart attack. We had been married for just a month. The marriage that ended too soon left me with Joe, my husband's child from a previous relationship. Despite his biological mother's rare appearance, Joe never once looked up, remaining hunched over in his seat at the funeral home. Everyone seemed to show sympathy for Joe from a distance, but their attitudes shifted upon witnessing Emma's behavior. It's inevitable, being the child of such a mother, that the child's blood is no good either. Eventually, Mike's relatives started making selfish remarks. Who's going to take Joe in? Your place, maybe? We definitely can't. I slowly stood up and rushed to Joe's side, looking into his face. Are you okay? Want to go to another room? Hey, you don't need to care for me. I can just go to a facility or something. Feeling a tightness in my chest, before I could even think, I was hugging Joe. 
I could feel the cold stares of those around us. Then someone audibly remarked, which stirred my emotions. Raising a dead husband's child is insane. Stepping away from Joe, I clenched his hand and shouted at the relatives watching from a distance. No matter what anyone says, I will raise this child properly. My emphatic declaration was met with skepticism by everyone at the funeral home. Then, a petite man sitting in the funeral home chairs coughed softly before walking up to me and looked into my eyes. It was Tom, my dad, whom I hadn't seen in a long time. Are you saying you'll raise that child all by yourself? Yes. I will make Mike's child something to be proud of. Don't be ridiculous. Dad suddenly pulled Joe's arm towards him and stormed out of the funeral home. My name is Nancy. I lived with a man I met in college, thinking we would marry someday. On an ordinary day, not a special anniversary, he gave me something somewhat like a proposal. It wasn't particularly romantic, but I fondly remember the small, cute flower he gave me at that time. It was a small, star-shaped white flower that grew in a corner of a nearby parking lot. It was a star lily. I didn't rush into marriage immediately after the proposal, but after some time, I decided to go to the gynecologist alone. It was because when I told a friend I might marry my boyfriend, she had asked. Aren't you going to get checked? While I was sitting in the gynecologist's clean waiting room, I overheard a conversation. It was between a daughter in her twenties and her mother, discussing the daughter's upcoming marriage next month. I didn't intend to eavesdrop, but the mother spoke loudly, mentioning her daughter was there for a bridal check. Receiving my boyfriend's proposal, I came here with the same thought, feeling a bit scared and shaky. What if the examination today reveals some disease? How should I explain it to him? I wanted to ask the chatting mother and daughter sitting next to me. Hey, if you found a disease, would you still marry your loved one? The warm sunlight through the window brightened the waiting room. As the parent and child who finished their consultation earlier left with smiles, it was my turn for the examination. When I left the hospital after the examination, the previously sunny sky had turned overcast, looking like it might rain at any moment. Weeks later, the examination results revealed that my body has difficulty conceiving children. Eventually, I broke up with that boyfriend. I didn't explain the reason to him. Or should I say, I didn't want to. I didn't want his sympathy, nor had I ever really wanted children. Avoiding the gaze of children in passing families, I had to tell myself I didn't like kids, or else I felt like I would sink into despair. Years later, I met Mike, a man from a business deal, and I fell for him. Despite deciding never to fall in love again, I found myself drawn to Mike's lonely expression. I asked Mike out. Sitting by the window of a cafe near my workplace, we might have been trying to figure each other out. Then, as if making up his mind, Mike straightened up and began to speak. I'm actually divorced. I have a son and we live together. I see. That's okay with me. And besides, I have difficulty conceiving. What? So I want to raise your child as my own. At this point, I had never met Mike's son. But I was determined to cherish him if he was my own. Mike smiled sadly for a moment before whispering in a soft, thin voice. Thank you. And that's how our relationship began. Emma, Mike's ex-wife, apparently abandoned her household and childcare duties and left the home. It's unclear if that was the direct cause, but Joe, their son, must have felt lonely. Despite being only 10 years old, he would hang out with older friends near the station late into the night. Mike's job kept him busy, often returning home late, leaving little time to connect with Joe. Soon after we started dating, I asked for an opportunity to meet Joe and sincerely told him that I was seriously considering marriage with Mike. I then decided to visit their home daily, preparing meals and spending time with Joe. I cooked kid-friendly dishes like pizza, chicken nuggets, and pasta, making sure he ate plenty. Initially hesitant, Joe began to open up and show his genuine, childlike side. Joe, do you like tonight's dinner? Yeah, it's delicious. I wanted to stop Joe from wandering out at night 
so I would finish my work early and always come by in the evening to cook. That alone made Mike deeply grateful, and a year into our relationship, we decided to get married. Legally becoming Joe's parent filled me with happiness. We didn't report our marriage to my parents. Mike's parents had already passed away. It wasn't that I had a bad relationship with my parents or any special circumstances, I just hadn't seen them for many years. I was raised by my father after losing my mother at a young age. I'd like to meet Grandpa someday. Joe said so smiling and to that, with little hesitation, I nodded. After getting married, I tried harder than ever to cook for Joe and do as much motherly things as possible. But I had no motherly role model. My father was always busy with work, and I don't have many memories of being doted on. Young women, who seemed to be employees at my father's glass factory, would come to keep me company and cook for me in turns. The sound of glass clinking, echoing from the nearby factory until night, still lingers in my ears. When I went to see my father at the factory wanting to see him, I was scolded severely. So, I hid in the shadows and watched him from a distance. From afar, I watched my father staring at the molten glass in the dark factory. There was a very small flower bed in the corner of the factory, where white star-shaped flowers bloomed. I remember vividly picking one of those white flowers and waiting at home alone. As I waited for Mike's return, confirming Joe had fallen asleep, the thought of my father suddenly crossed my mind. I should visit my father. I want to introduce Mike and Joe to him. I was curious about his reaction. As I was about to look up my father's contact on my mobile phone, an unknown number called. I answered the phone. It was cold. The voice of a woman I didn't know, the content, the air, everything felt cold. It was the news that Mike had suddenly collapsed at work and was taken to the hospital by ambulance. I wanted to rush there, but hesitated because Joe was sleeping. And that hesitation is something I would regret for the rest of my life. An hour after being taken to the hospital, I was informed that Mike had passed away. The doctor later explained it seemed to be a heart attack. The cause of death didn't matter to me. What I wanted to know was not why Mike died. But how Joe and I were supposed to live without him. I didn't cry even after Mike died. It was too sudden, and it didn't feel real. Without much thought, I blandly discussed funeral arrangements with the funeral home the hospital referred, and the proceedings went on mechanically. Joe, like me, probably couldn't grasp the reality. Sitting in the funeral home chair with the same expression as always, I looked boredly at the floor. A flamboyantly dressed woman appeared, and Mike's relatives started to argue with her after she approached them. I couldn't hear the conversation clearly, but she was Emma, Mike's divorced ex-wife, seemingly pressing about an inheritance or the lack thereof. Desperately, the relatives explained. There's nothing like that. Amidst this, it felt like someone had asked what would become of Joe. Emma yelling caused quite a scene at the funeral. I have no intention of taking Joe in. Just put him in some facility or something. Can't you see he's the one who's hurt the most? Can you not speak so thoughtlessly? Oh, are you Mike's new wife? I heard about you. He died shortly after getting remarried, right? What are you going to do in this situation? You have no connection to Joe at all. You can't possibly feel a bond after just one month of being a parent and child, can you? As I continued to glare silently, Emma shrugged and smirked. You seem young. You'd better make a choice you won't regret. With those parting words, she left the funeral home. Despite his real mother making an appearance for the first time in a while, Joe never once looked up. Everyone seemed to show sympathy for Joe, but their attitudes changed after witnessing the ex-wife's behavior. It's clear, being the child of such a mother, that child is beyond help too. Whispers began circulating that it's impossible to fight blood and how there's no obligation to raise a child not related by blood. Eventually, Mike's relatives started making selfish remarks. Who's going to take Joe in? Your place, maybe? We definitely can't. Are you okay? Want to go to another room? Hey, you don't need to care for me. I can just go to a facility or something. 
feeling a tightness in my chest, before I could even think, I was hugging Joe. I could feel the cold stares from those around us. Someone said loud enough for me to hear. Raising a dead husband's child, are you out of your mind? That's when my emotions surged. Stepping away from Joe, I clenched his hand and shouted at the relatives watching from a distance. No matter what anyone says, I will raise this child properly. Calm down a bit. You have no obligation to do this. Honestly, it would be better for your future to just put him in a facility. Shut up. Even if I'm alone, I'll make sure to raise him right. My defiant declaration was met with skepticism by everyone at the funeral home. What would become of Joe's life if I also disappeared from his side now that Mike was gone? I won't let him be lonely like I was as a child. I refuse to let that happen. Then, a petite man sitting in the funeral home chairs coughed softly before walking up to me and looked intently into my eyes. It was Tom, my dad, whom I hadn't seen in a long time. Are you saying you'll raise that child by yourself? Yes. I will make something of Mike's child. Don't joke. You have no idea how hard that's going to be. Dad suddenly pulled Joe's arm towards him and stormed out of the funeral home. Ignoring the other relatives' stunned reactions, we faced each other in the parking lot just outside. I followed and tried to pull Joe away from my father, but was pushed back with a strength that belied his small stature. Your name's Joe, right? I'm your grandfather. What? Yeah. How about it? You'd have to move, but would you come live with me? There's a factory near my house where I work. It's a bit noisy. As Joe struggled to respond to the sudden invitation, Dad turned to me with a sad look and said, Nancy, come home. He suggested it would be sad and difficult for a child to be raised by just a woman, and that I should come back to my family home. After the funeral, the relatives stopped bothering me with unnecessary comments. It was as if they no longer wanted to be involved with Joe and I. I had been determined to raise Joe on my own, but it was just bravado. I was actually scared, anxious, and wanted to disappear. Joe hadn't cried since Mike passed away. And I hadn't yet felt the reality of his death, nor had I felt truly sad. But when Dad reached out to me with a look of concern, something inside me broke free, and I found myself crying in my dad's arms like a child. Are you okay? I felt Joe watching me as I continued to cry. After that, Joe and I vacated our apartment and left home. Dad came to pick us up, and we headed to my childhood home in his car. The scenery passing by the car window seemed melancholic, making me feel as if the memories I had with Mike were drifting further away. Upon returning home, a new life for Joe and I began. From his first day at the new school, something was off about Joe. I casually encouraged him, saying it's not easy to make friends right away, and sent him off to school as usual the next day. I started helping out at the glass factory my father ran. Inside the factory, a few male craftsmen were blowing glass to make dishes. My job was to inspect the finished glass products. Picking up each item one by one and wiping it down with a cloth. I felt deeply moved, now as an adult doing the very work I was scolded for watching from a distance as a child because it was dangerous. Among the employees, there was a veteran lady who used to take care of me, and she happily remarked how the once little Nancy was all grown up. Though Dad no longer manufactures glass as an active craftsman, he was chatting with what seemed like a salesperson at a small desk near the workshop. I occasionally watched the glass blowing process from the corner of my eye while doing my job. The sight of the molten glass glowing orange in the furnace, being gathered on the end of a long rod and blown into a balloon-like shape, was nothing short of magnificent. I felt a slight desire to try it myself. But there was no atmosphere for beginners to experience glass blowing in this factory. The craftsmen worked silently, fluidly forming glass. Realizing that my father was the one leading these skilled craftsmen filled me with a bit of pride. At that time, I believe I was doing my best to adapt to this unfamiliar new life. And Joe probably was too. At a school PTA meeting, a nosy parent told me about Joe's situation at school. 
It seemed that the fact Joe and I were not blood-related had already become a neighborhood rumor, and many students at his school were talking behind his back. Hearing this left me with a heavy heart as I started to walk, filled with various thoughts. I had been completely unaware of this, unable to even imagine it. It was something I should have considered, yet it had never crossed my mind. Mostly, I was overrun with regrets, excuses, a desire to escape, and the strong wish that Mike was still here with me. Returning home, I walked down the hallway and knocked on Joe's room door. Joe, can I come in? Don't open it. Joe's somewhat hoarse voice came through. After taking a breath, I quietly said, I'm sorry. Joe, if you're okay with it, could you tell me about what's happening at school? Joe didn't respond. I stood in front of the door for a while before eventually giving up and starting to prepare dinner. Day by day, conversations with Joe dwindled. Perhaps he sensed my forced smiles as I tried to inquire about school. He stopped sharing anything about his daily life. Eventually, Joe stopped going to school and began shutting himself in his room, living like a recluse. Though he was supposed to be at school in the mornings, it seemed he returned home after I left for work. Even at work, where I needed to concentrate, I found myself thinking about Joe, leading to mistakes like dropping freshly made glassware and getting scolded. Dad noticed my distress and offered to talk with me. However, I felt unable to share my troubles with my father, who had left me to focus on his work during my childhood. Yet, Dad kept calling me after work. Talk to me if something's wrong. He would repeatedly say. Despite his insistence, I couldn't bring myself to confide in Dad. Each time he said to talk to him if something happened, it felt as though he was reminding me to protect Joe, leading me to ponder every night until I came up with an idea. One morning, I quietly handed Joe a mobile phone while he was eating breakfast. Seeing his suddenly brightened expression, I smiled a little. I bought a mobile phone, matching with mine. If it's hard to talk about school stuff, you can text me. I might be able to help. Okay. Joe carefully cradled the new mobile phone placed on the table with both hands. For a while, there was no contact from Joe. Considering I hadn't had time to teach him how to use the mobile phone, it seemed natural, until one day, I suddenly received a message. It was written that he had learned how to use the mobile phone from a kind employee at the glass factory, so he decided to send a message. Gradually, though sparingly, he began to share things about school through messages. As a mother, I wanted to do everything I could, but even after hearing about his school life, there wasn't much I could do to help except to send encouraging words through messages. Still, I wondered if that had made Joe happy. After getting the mobile phone, he started going to school regularly and began to lead a normal school life. Even as a middle schooler, he went to school diligently without causing any major problems, and eventually became a high school student. By this time, Joe had stopped needing to communicate through messages and would talk to me face to face about his day at school impressing me with his candidness. One holiday, Dad took Joe for a tour inside the glass factory. It was near the high-temperature furnace used for forming glass, an area I had been constantly warned as a child to stay away from because it was dangerous. Watching Joe being carefully taught and experiencing making a basic glass cup filled me with immense joy. From that day on, Dad spent his weekends and days off teaching Joe how to make glass. Dad's glasswork was artistic. It gave a special sensation, almost as if holding the drink directly. Time passed and Joe was in his junior year in high school. He wasn't interested in going to college nor was he enthusiastic about getting a job, struggling to decide on a career path. The pressure from teachers and the inability to choose a post-graduation path until winter might have been partly my fault as his parent. During weekends, while I was busy with paperwork in a corner of the factory, Joe and Dad would take breaks together, sitting and staring at the heated glass furnace. Does it make sense to do manual work in an era when most factories are transitioning to machines for glass production? Joe asked Dad out of curiosity, to which Dad responded with a thoughtful look, crossing his arms. During his adolescence, it's unclear how Joe viewed Dad as a craftsman, but Dad seemed to ponder deeply over Joe's words. P. 
People say our job is a dying industry. But we're still making a living out of it, which means there's value in it. There are people who appreciate the glass I make. Aren't you scared of going bankrupt? I'm terrified, to be honest. Bankruptcy is scary. I brought over cups of coffee to them. Using the glass cups Joe had made his practice. Dad looked at Joe's glass and sipped his coffee, showing a hint of sadness. When machines started taking over the glass industry, I was young. Nancy was little, and I didn't have time to play with her. Every day was filled with fear and no room for relaxation. I was desperate not to lose my mind from all the work. I wonder if mom was lonely too. Probably. I hardly took care of Nancy. The thought that she had only me, her only family, scared me to death. Dad looked around the factory. I lost my wife shortly after starting this company. But I didn't have the luxury to mourn. I needed money to raise Nancy. I had to keep the company going to support my employees. I was desperate not to make my beloved daughter sad. Dad. Pathetic, right? I was just a man who could only think of himself. Hesitantly, I reached out and touched Dad's hand. His hands were thin but large with long fingers. Hands that had crafted countless glasses. I knelt before Dad, eventually wrapping both hands around his. Something resonated within me. As if something was speaking to my heart. Thank you, Dad, for raising me. Didn't you listen? I didn't do anything. I was just desperately afraid of becoming hopeless. No, I knew you were. I knew Dad was working hard for me. I used to watch my father work hard from outside the factory, always finding ways to pass the time at the factory entrance. The handmade flower bed that changed with the seasons had been planted by someone. Then one day, when I was still young, one of my employees taught me who had been making these flower beds. I was told it was Dad who planted them. There was no way Dad could be interested in flowers. Surely, it was planted for me, thinking all girls like flowers. Now, no more flowers were planted there. When the star lilies that had sprouted from seeds carried by the wind bloomed around the factory, Joe graduated high school and started working at Dad's glass factory. Dad, who had been focusing more on paperwork, began working with glass again. The intricate glass works he created was purely magnificent, and both Joe and I respected him for it. As time passed, Joe married a woman introduced by Dad and built a duplex house insisting we live together, despite my initial refusal. Dad was also invited to live with us, but he refused. I can't sleep unless I'm near the workshop. Eventually, when my grandchild was born and Joe was busy with work, I took care of the baby. Walking with the baby, I pointed out Joe working in the factory. Look, there's Dad. I tilt my grandson's face slightly to look at Joe. Without saying a word, the baby suddenly pointed at a small star lily at our feet. The delicate star-shaped flowers scattered around the factory, and as I set the baby down, it happily played with the flowers. What are you doing? That's dangerous! Joe came out of the factory, scolding yet looking at his child with joy. I hope to protect this small life that lies beyond this smile forever. Mommy's promise comes first, so please go to the hospital with this. My husband takes out $20 from his wallet and hands it to me. Overwhelmed by the unexpected turn of events, I could only stand dumbfounded, watching him drive away in his car. Unbelievably, he left his wife, struggling with her water broken, to prioritize picking up and dropping off his mother for her hobby classes. Despite the harassment from his mother and the numerous difficulties I faced, I tolerated it all, thinking of our soon-to-be-born child. But now, it's clear to me. Someone who treats their child so poorly doesn't deserve to be a parent. Bearing the recurring pain, I made up my mind to face childbirth alone. My name is Kristen. I married Scott right after graduating from college. Scott and I have an age difference of three years, and we have led a fairly happy life. He was one of in my college clubmates. 
He seemed to have taken a liking to me when I joined as a freshman, and looking back, his passionate advances were almost embarrassing. As a young adult, a guy's appealing inevitably seemed cool, and I reciprocated his affection, leading to a smooth relationship from three months after my enrollment until graduation. Even after marriage, he was deeply in love with me, so I never worried about infidelity. He boasted at work about his happiness in returning home on time every day to eat the dinner I cooked while it was still warm, so I doubted any woman would intentionally approach him. However, he has always been particularly kind to women, attracting some attention. But since he was always devoted to me, I never let my gaze wander. Yet, there's a reason why I described our seemingly perfect marriage as fairly happy. That reason is his mother, Evelyn's presence. I thought the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law conflict was a thing of the past, but she frowned upon seeing me. What's the purpose for today? It was all of sudden. You should have informed me in advance so that I could be prepared properly. Besides you look have no gifts even being invited home. It's just bad manners. You knew you were meeting us, you should have taken care of all of these. Oh, dear, why don't you leave my son and go home today? That's what she said during my first visit to my in-law's house before our marriage, and being still young, I turned pale with fear. Although I told her about the schedule to visit beforehand, indeed, I should have brought some gifts to meet Evely for the first time at her house. Feeling embarrassed and frustrated at being seen through, I remained downcast for a while. It was my fault for the etiquette breach, but if Evelyn had been a bit more restrained in her words, I wouldn't have been so upset. Because of my failure, I was virtually separated from Scott and had to return home alone from my first visit to my in-laws, leading to a phone call from Scott later. Mommy was nervous and ended up being a bit harsh. She actually likes you, Kristen, so don't worry. She approves of our marriage and really wants you to visit again. At that moment, I was infuriated by his optimistic tone. He didn't advise me before visiting her house and wouldn't stop Evelyn when she insulted me right in front of him. Her wanting me to visit again was undoubtedly not her true intention. Would marrying him mean being pressured into living together and facing daily harassment? Surprisingly, she made no such suggestions when I decided to marry Scott. However, relieved for only a moment, she began frequently summoning Scott to her house. Just when you finally graduated from a distant university and got a job locally, you're getting married. I've been so lonely. Why don't you let Kristen have a break and stay with me for a week or so? Such messages would arrive for Scott, terrifying me. Showing me the message, he asked. What should we do? In his place, I called Evelyn right there and then. I'm sorry for the inconvenience after your kind consideration, but we still haven't finished unpacking and handling paperwork from the move. I think it will be a while before Scott can relax. Sorry. When I said this, just unpack by yourself. Don't always rely on my son. She grumbled, but I simply nodded along and ended the call. Her offer to ease my burden was just a pretext but she wanted her beloved son by her side. My anger rose towards Evelyn for her lack of consideration, even though we were newlyweds, and also towards Scott, who just laughed off the situation and wouldn't say no. According to him, Evelyn has always been like this. Her overprotectiveness worsened after divorcing Scott's father, and she even cried and tried to stop him from going to college. Somehow, he convinced her and went, but they kept in constant contact through messages and calls. He trusts his mother, who raised him as a single parent, so their relationship has always been good, as I knew from our dating days. It's great to be caring towards a child and a mother, but as adults, there should be a proper distance. However, this closeness was normal for them, and I knew it wasn't right to interfere in another family's dynamics. If it weren't for this, Scott, who is serious about both work and house chores and has a good personality, would have been perfect, so I tried to accept it. But it wasn't long before I couldn't overlook the excessive closeness between the two. One holiday, when Scott usually sleeps till noon, he woke up earlier than me and started preparing to go out. Did we have plans to go somewhere today? I asked, I'm going out shopping with mommy, so you can stay and sleep. 
and he replied unbelievably. Apparently, Evelyn wanted to buy clothes and asked him for his opinion. Angry at his willingness to go, we have a day off together for the first time in a while, let's do something. I controlled my emotions and suggested, but Scott shook his head, I'd like that, but I've already promised mommy, and she seems to be waiting outside. Shocked by his words, I went to the entrance in my pajamas. Looking out the window, I saw Evelyn's bright red car parked in the yard. Noticing my gaze, Evelyn got out of her car, smirking, with her bright red lipstick. Scott, you're late. Oh, Kristen is still asleep? Such a lazy wife for my son. Maybe I should buy you an alarm clock as a souvenir? Mocking me, she affectionately took Scott's hand and led him to the passenger seat. I was dumbfounded by their close relationship and could only watch Evelyn's car drive away swiftly. After this incident, Scott's behavior began to change gradually. He hardly did any housework he used to do routinely and often went to his mother's house almost every weekend. His attitude towards me changed too, becoming more demanding. Kristen, you're too lazy. If I'm off, you just sleep along. Can you call that fulfilling your duties as a housewife? You don't even put on makeup when you're at home. It's not good to slack off just because you're a wife. Mommy is worried about you too. Why don't you visit her alone sometime? I didn't know what Evelyn was saying about me, but his agreement was troubling. He had never mentioned napping or makeup during our relationship. But as he said, perhaps Evelyn was genuinely concerned about my behavior. I tried to convince myself of this multiple times, but knowing Evelyn's behavior towards Scott, it seemed more like harassment. I thought Evelyn's curse would change once we had a child. Soon after my doubts about Scott began, I discovered I was pregnant. He was thrilled, promising to support me. But Evelyn's harassment intensified. Summoning Scott for trivial tasks like shopping, doctor visits, and cleaning her house, effectively leaving me alone. When I explained Evelyn's malicious intentions to him, it backfired. Suddenly, he became infuriated and said, Every time mommy sees you, she talks about you. How you should go back to your parents' house, or how you need time alone. Getting angry over such things will affect the baby in your womb. Just indulge in mommy's feelings. He began leaving me alone more often. As time passed, my morning sickness worsened, and I told him I wanted him to stay with me as much as possible because I felt uneasy being alone. But Scott replied, what can I do even if I'm with you? Mommy also wanted to be alone during her pregnancy, didn't even want to see dad's face. He wouldn't listen to anything I said. Feeling physically and mentally unstable, I lost the energy to argue back and resolved to fight this battle alone. Then, one day, while Scott and I were shopping for baby items, we bumped into his colleague who said to me, Scott, I heard you've been actively attending parenting classes. Your home bookshelf is filled with parenting books, right? Accompanying your wife for shopping today, you're going to be a great dad for sure. Can't wait for your child to be born. Shocked, huh? I blurted out. Scott quickly intervened, please stop. Laughing off in a joking manner. Turns out, Scott had been pretending at work to be an attentive new father, even fabricating stories. I kept silent about this to his colleague to avoid any trouble but felt a rising anger inside. Still, he continued to prioritize his time with Evelyn, and whenever I met his colleagues, your wife has caught herself an ideal husband, they would say. Such incidents gradually made me distrust his actions and words. I can't say for sure if this stress was the cause, but one weekend, while preparing lunch, I noticed my pants were wet. A thought crossed my mind, and I rushed to the bathroom. As I suspected, my water had broken. I yelled towards the room where Scott was still sleeping, telling him to get the car ready immediately. He, still groggy, became anxious upon hearing about the water break and supported me as I walked. The nurses had repeatedly told us to come to the hospital immediately if my water broke, as there could be urgent risks. Scott, slightly panicked, helped me into the car amidst my contractions. Just as we started driving, his mobile phone rang. Unable to answer while driving, I glanced at the screen while struggling with the pain. 
Seeing Evelyn's name, I had a bad feeling. The phone kept ringing, and after staring at the screen for a while, I reluctantly answered, Scott, where are you? It's Wednesday, the day of my sewing class. Did you forget? Her flirting voice terrified me, but I explained to her, Evelyn, actually, my water just broke, and Scott is taking me to the hospital right now. As soon as I spoke, Evelyn yelled as if she was a different person. That's your problem, isn't it? I don't care. Using Scott, who's resting, as a taxi is quite a position you're in. Let me talk to Scott. Today is my regular sewing class day, and I have a prior appointment. I was speechless at her disregard, even for her grandchild's well-being. Her shrill voice continued to echo, even as I remained silent. Sorry, Kristen. Scott muttered. For a moment, I thought he was apologizing for Evelyn yelling at me. But then I realized Scott had walked around to the back seat where I was lying and opened the door. Confused and enduring the pain, I was stunned. Then he said, I had promised to drive mommy, so could you take a taxi or an ambulance from here? I'll definitely catch up later, so go ahead. Wait a minute! Are you prioritizing a sewing class over your own child? Since you won't listen to me, please convince Evelyn yourself. The pain is getting worse, hurry! I raised my voice out of desperation, but he, frowning as well, replied, It's a weekly commitment, can't be helped, right? I'm sorry I forgot to tell you about it. Here's some money, please manage with this. He took out $20 from his wallet and shoved it into my bag. Then he got back in the driver's seat and left without hesitation. I can't believe it! The place where he dropped me off was still close to our house. Concerned about the neighbors seeing me, I hurriedly searched for a taxi company. The amniotic fluid continued to trickle down my legs, and panic set in as I realized the danger to my unborn child. Tears welled up in my eyes as I struggled with the phone, wondering why my baby and I had to suffer like this. Kristen! Startled, I turned around and saw a familiar face. You look terrible! Forget talking, just get in the car! The person got out of their car, gently supported me, and helped me into the back seat. Her husband adjusted the seat and drove. My memory of what followed is hazy. Upon reaching the hospital, I was quickly wheeled in a wheelchair and taken to a prepared room by nurses. The pain was so severe that I was moaning, but I was told there was still time before delivery, so I rested there. The pain was so intense that I nearly lost consciousness, and suddenly, my mobile phone rang. Thinking it might be a callback from a call to my mother during the journey, I was shocked to see it was Scott. Looking at the clock, it was already evening. Three hours had passed since I left, and in disbelief, I decided not to answer. But as the calls persisted, I answered in irritation. Kristen, help me! I want you to explain the situation. Not a single word of concern for me, and I had no idea what had happened to him. Help me. That's it. Even if he was being eaten by a crocodile, I had no obligation to help someone who could abandon his own child. Who do you think you are, saying such things? I yelled through the phone at him and hung up. Some time later, I went into labor alone. Though I wished for Scott's support, I was better off without a foolish man who couldn't prioritize correctly. Instead, a kind nurse supported me, and by late night, my much-awaited baby was born safely. Exhausted, I fell asleep quickly after the birth. The next morning, a nurse came to my room first thing to tell me that Scott had come. Apparently, he had arrived right after the birth, but seeing how deeply I was sleeping, the nurse kindly sent him away. Honestly, I felt I never needed to see him again. But when he entered the room, looking tired, I couldn't help but ask him what happened. The person who picked me up and took me to the hospital was Misty, an older lady in the neighborhood with whom I was always friendly. She had been like a mother to me, caring for me like her own daughter since I was newly married and insecure. When she asked about Scott in the car, I told her he was taking Evelyn to her hobby class, and she got angry as if it were her own matter. Little did I know that this would end up cornering Scott. After dropping me off, Misty spread the story throughout the neighborhood. Being sociable and always chatting with friends, her influence was significant, 
and her friends seemed to have confronted Scott in mass. The trouble that he wanted help with was apparently this situation. With that, a huge commotion had formed around our house with many people gathering. As panicked as he was, seeking my help in that situation was clearly a lack of intelligence. I hadn't heard from Evelyn at all, and my mind was already made up. I'm sorry, but can you leave? I'm not feeling well, and my parents are about to arrive. Do our parents know about this? I want to apologize, can I stay? He spoke in a pitiful, muttering voice. What are you saying? I don't care about your apologies. I'm busy, so please leave. Don't say that. Where's the baby? I just want to see her and then I'll go. Just leave. There are other pregnant women here, so get out. I replied coldly and, as he still stood there, I turned my back, lay down, and covered myself with a blanket. Hey, I'm sorry. Can you call mommy for me? I want to send her a picture of the baby, can I call a nurse? Unbelievably, Scott reached out and shook me, just as I was about to lose my patience and push him away. What are you doing? Don't touch her. My parents entered the room. My mother rushed to my side and pushed him away. How dare you shake someone who just gave birth? And to show up without considering the situation. I'm disappointed in you. Get out now. Her fierceness, which I had never seen before, overwhelmed Scott, and he finally left the room. My father followed him, likely giving Scott a thorough scolding. During my hospital stay, I refused to see him and took the baby back to my parents' house after being discharged. Concerned about him doing something, I initiated the divorce over the phone without meeting him. I told him about the divorce papers to be mailed and the compensation claim, ignoring any objections from him. The compensation was for the scrapes and bruises I got when he forcefully made me get out of the car. He tried to make excuses, but I silenced him by mentioning the testimony of Misty and her husband and the photos of the injuries taken that day. The lawyer said the costs for his malicious actions towards a pregnant woman would be significant. While I was busy with the baby, Evelyn barged into my parents' house once. The rumor spread by Misty persisted, and the neighbor's gaze was cold. She blamed everything on me for not respecting her and her son, but my strict father handled it all. Both Evelyn and Scott were dealt with by my father, making me think it should have been this way from the start. But he said, the head of the family doesn't always stand out in the open. He was strangely trying to be cool about it. When I became accustomed to parenting, I invited Misty to my parents' house and introduced her. She quickly became friends with my mother, as they were of the same generation, and we all agreed to keep in touch. During that visit, Misty shared a story she had heard from a friend who works part-time at my ex-husband's company. Her friend, like Misty, loves gossip and apparently let slip the story of Scott to others. This quickly spread and was exaggerated, leading to a decline in his reputation. The contrast between his portrayal as a dedicated new father and the reality had a significant impact and he resigned from his job, facing cold treatment from his bosses and colleagues. Now in his late thirties, jobless and without qualifications, he became a recluse, living off Evelyn's pension and savings, fearful of the neighbor's judgment. Years later, out of the blue, I received another call from him. Hey, where are you? I'm in front of your parents' house, but nobody's inside. His first words were curt, so I responded similarly. Can't you understand? We've moved. What do you want? Moved? Did you use the compensation money I gave you to enjoy yourself? Come back right now, let's start over. Mommy wants to see you too. Your words make no sense. Why would I benefit from going back to you? Still talking about mommy after all this time? I don't want to hear anything from you, so don't call me again. I hung up without waiting for a reply, and my phone kept lighting up for a while. After finally setting up call blocking, I started receiving messages from him, asking for reconciliation. I read them just in case, but they were all nonsensical, saying things like, Don't you feel sorry for the child not having a father? It's ungrateful not to let mommy see you after all she's done for you. 
So, I deleted all the messages and changed my email address. Although what happened was awful, it allowed me to proceed with the divorce advantageously and impose sanctions on him. Having such a worthless person in our lives would be worse for my child. Thinking so, I've been enjoying a relaxed parenting life, supported by my parents, who have become wonderful grandparents. I was standing there, unable to move or understand what was happening to me, when my husband Harrison, who was next to me, asked, Are you okay? It was then that I realized I had been doused with water. In front of me was Mael Jeanette, holding a cup and smirking nastily. This is not your place! You're shamelessly overstepping! How many times do I have to tell you you're not welcome here? Jeanette's angry shout filled the room at Fail Frank's funeral. My name is Mila, a 35-year-old self-employed business owner. I met Harrison through a mutual acquaintance six years ago, and we married after I got pregnant. We've had our ups and downs, but now we live happily with our one-year-old daughter. Harrison's family owns a retail shop selling miscellaneous goods and vintage clothing. Harrison, their only son, went to college in Boston, intending to take over the family business. However, after landing a job at a major corporation post-graduation, his parents easily conceded. There's no need for you to take over our debt-ridden business. We're proud you can work at a prestigious company. Don't worry about us, build your own family in Boston. Encouraged by his father Frank, Harrison worked diligently in Boston and achieved a promotion to a managerial position at a young age. We met, quickly started dating, and before we knew it, I was pregnant. Since our relationship had been headed towards marriage, the sequence of events have changed, leading to us announcing both our marriage and pregnancy to our parents at the same time. My parents, who live in another state, were delighted with my marriage and pregnancy, except for Jeanette. What? Pregnant? With him? I still vividly remember Jeanette's words to me during my first visit to Harrison's family home. Frank scolded Jeanette, but he only made excuses for her in a low voice to me, especially regarding Harrison, saying, She doesn't mean it. And Jeanette, having her son's girlfriend over for the first time, offered nothing at all. It wasn't naivety or an oversight, but a deliberate display of not offering anything. Pregnant? Are you going to have the baby? Then you must continue the environment I provided for my son and raise your child the same way. I'll teach you how. Wait a minute. I'm planning to take maternity leave and then return to work, so I appreciate your concern, but we will decide and manage our child's upbringing. Though I was reluctant to argue with my MIL on our first meeting, I felt that it would be important for her to understand our stance. Jeanette, clearly not expecting me to talk back, glared at me, her face filled with surprise and anger. Then she pressed on, what kind of job forces you to work instead of raising your child? Jeanette seemed to be implying dissatisfaction with her son's salary at a major corporation, aggressively questioning me. When I mentioned that I was the secretary to the president of a publicly traded company, Jeanette looked at me scornfully and said, that's distasteful. Jeanette appeared to have a stereotype of secretaries as glamorous women serving powerful men or attractive but incompetent at their jobs. Is Harrison being deceived? Are you really marrying him? She asked repeatedly. Harrison, with a strained laugh, simply said, yes. He didn't support me but instead laughed it off, eager to leave the situation, which left me feeling disappointed and unsure about our marriage. However, Frank, having listened to the whole conversation, was different. It's tough to be a secretary. Before I was married, I worked at a company where the bosses had secretaries. It's a really difficult job. This idea of secretaries being distasteful is so outdated. He said, criticizing Jeanette. Jeanette, not expecting to be reprimanded, turned red and hastily said, I need to step out for a bit, and left the house. Frank later reassured me, if you have any troubles, you can always come to us for advice. Hearing that, I felt for the first time that I was accepted as a member of the family. After that, since our marriage was sudden due to the pregnancy, we didn't have a wedding ceremony and just completed the paperwork. After the birth, 
We had talked about having a small ceremony with just close family once things settled down, but those plans fell through dramatically. What? Dad has cancer? Harrison was shaken by the sudden news, and since I was worried about him going alone, I went with him to the hospital where Frank was admitted. As soon as we arrived at the hospital, we were called by a doctor and, without any mental preparation, were informed about Frank's limited time left. Entering his room, we saw Frank with numerous tubes attached to his arm, it was painfully hard to look at. Noticing us, Frank gave a sorry smile and said, my apologies. I wondered why Frank, who had done nothing wrong, was apologizing, but soon understood. Frank had been hospitalized for several days, and Jeanette hadn't visited him at all. According to Frank, since he was given a terminal diagnosis, Jeanette thought he wouldn't know what was happening and took the opportunity to go on trips and shopping sprees. Frank didn't know for sure since he was in the hospital, but he heard it from neighbors who visited him, so it was likely true. Frank, unable to prepare his own change of pajamas and underwear during his hospital stay, said to us apologetically, I'm sorry to ask this so soon after your wedding, but I need your help. Since my pregnancy was stable, I had no problem going to the hospital in the morning, so I gladly took on the role of caring for Frank. I was originally planning to take maternity leave at nine months pregnant, but with Frank's care needed, I applied for caregiving leave at my company, planning to transition it into maternity leave. But even this didn't go as planned. With Frank's hospitalization, Jeanette began neglecting housework entirely to indulge in her leisure activities every day. Consequently, the house became cluttered with garbage and Jeanette, who was somewhat osteoporotic, slipped, fell, and fractured her bones. Now, not only Frank's but also Jeanette's care fell onto us. Please, just until mom can walk again, can we live together? Frank's cancer treatment was stabilizing, and he was close to being discharged when Jeanette fractured her bone. My husband asked me, and I reluctantly agreed to live together for a limited time, but this decision would later become a source of great regret. You slowpoke! Hurry up and prepare the meal! Jeanette, now having difficulty walking and using crutches, started hurling verbal abuse at me due to her frustration of being immobile. I had to clean the room Jeanette dirted for Frank's return, but with my growing belly, it was hard labor, and I struggled to move as I wanted. Jeanette mercilessly berated me and would hit me with her crutches when nearby. I protected my belly as best I could, but my arms became covered in bruises. Such a big target, easy to hit. I was terrified, thinking this was the same woman who had once given birth. I reported Jeanette's harassment to Harrison, but he would just say, it's only for now. She's just stressed because of her injury. He showed no signs of helping me, and I felt increasingly cornered. And then, Jeanette, with her mobility impaired, brazenly started inviting men to the house during weekdays when Harrison was at work. Jeanette, does Frank know about this? It doesn't matter. He won't be returning to this house anyway. His time is almost up. This house and all the property will be mine. Jeanette said this and laughed loudly with the man who seemed to be her affair partner. She even threatened me, saying if I spoke to anyone about this, she would make me suffer. The repeated scenes of Jeanette's verbal and physical abuse haunted me every night, leading to severe headaches and palpitations that kept me awake. Eventually, I miscarried the baby. I can't even see my grandchild's face because of you. You useless thing. Jeanette cruelly berated me as I returned home after the medical procedure. You're banned from this house. Get out now! Forced out of the house, I went straight to my company and submitted my resignation. My boss noticed something was off and repeatedly asked me not to do anything foolish. When I mentioned, my baby is gone. He said to contact him anytime if I needed anything, regardless of our professional relationship. He accepted my resignation without further questions. Afterwards, on my way to the courthouse to collect divorce papers, I decided to visit Frank for the final goodbye. It had been a few days since I last visited Frank's hospital room, and he was visibly surprised and concerned to see me, which brought me to tears. I had always kept silent about the treatment I received from Jeanette, 
not wanting to worry Frank, who was battling his illness. But Frank, who had noticed bruises on my arms before, asked me to tell him everything. Crying, I poured out everything that had happened. Frank kept apologizing and his face was contorted with anger. This is definitely a case for divorce. But I can't just let them get away with this. I want to fight back. I hate to ask this, but can you help me with one last request? After listening to my story, Frank proposed a plan for revenge against his wife and son. Feeling empowered by Frank's support, I felt ready to confront the situation, no longer wanting to be a victim. I don't want to just cry myself to sleep anymore. Whispering these words, Frank weakly grasped my hand and said, let's do this together. Subsequently, I stayed in the hospital room as Frank's attendant until his discharge. As soon as Frank and I arrived home, Jeanette snapped. What, you brought that useless woman too? You didn't clean the house, it's still dirty. Clean it up now. Furthermore, she accused, where have you been these past few days? You must have been with some man, right? When Frank told her I had been caring for him in the hospital, she was left speechless and silently left the house. Soon after, as planned with Frank, I installed indoor cameras and wireless listening devices in various places. This was to gather evidence of infidelity. As expected, when I accompanied Frank to the hospital for outpatient treatment, Jeanette confidently invited men into our home. We have the evidence, Frank said. Frank contacted a lawyer friend and began the process to disinherit Jeanette. Next, while Jeanette was away on a trip, Frank arranged for a negotiator to come to our home and create an official will. This was to prevent Jeanette from forging a will in Frank's name. Later, I started the process of taking over Frank's retail business, consulting a lawyer again. Despite the taxes and other financial issues that came with inheriting the business, I had a plan to recover the costs, so I decided to take it over. Honestly, I've been running the business just doing what I like, not really thinking about profit. But I want you to take this as compensation for the harm my family caused you, Mila. I was hesitant to accept the company and its real estate, but considering it as Frank's final gesture of goodwill, I gladly agreed. Frank, I'll protect this company, so don't worry. As I assured him, Frank smiled at me. After several hospital visits for chemotherapy and outliving the initial prognosis, Frank peacefully passed away at home, just as I was getting used to managing the business. Finally, doctors' life expectancy predictions are so unreliable. Let's quickly finish the funeral and turn this house and land into cash. Despite Frank having just passed away, I was unable to contain my anger at Jeanette's harsh words. You're no longer needed. I don't need your care anymore, so leave this house right now. Treating me as if shooing away an animal, I responded to Jeanette, I understand. I don't want to stay here for another minute. Saying that, I grabbed my pre-packed suitcase and prepared to leave. Harrison, who had always been like heir to me, didn't try to stop me as he wanted to stay with his beloved mother. Let's meet for the last time at the funeral, I said, and left for the weekly rental apartment I had arranged. After dropping off my luggage, I changed into morning clothes and headed to Frank's funeral for the final act of my revenge. Frank, beloved by the local residents, had attracted many people to his funeral. Getting out of the taxi, I was heading to the family's waiting room when Jeanette suddenly splashed water on me. This is not your place! You're shamelessly overstepping! How many times do I have to tell you you're not welcome here? After glaring at Harrison, who was feigning concern, I confronted Jeanette, it seems you don't understand anything, Jeanette. Are you all right in the head? You'll be the one in trouble when I leave. As I spoke, Jeanette retorted. Shut up! How dare you, just a son's wife! And once again threw liquid at me. Even I had to exclaim. What? If you're going to act like this, I'm leaving, and I won't forgive you no matter how much you cry or yell. With that, I walked away from Jeanette. I intended to take a taxi home immediately, but since the liquid Jeanette had thrown on me turned out to be alcohol, not water, I headed to the restroom to wash it off. 
It probably wouldn't stain, but I needed to clean the alcohol from my funeral attire and hair. After touching up my makeup, I exited the restroom to find an agitated Jeanette rushing towards me. What is this? Explain yourself! Not understanding what she meant, I listened silently as Jeanette ranted about the existence of another will separate from the one she was holding. Soon, relatives drawn by the commotion began to gather. Jeanette, forging a will is a serious crime. I said. When she acted ignorant, I explained in front of the relatives. Frank had already made a will and stored it with the courts. So the one Jeanette has is a fake. Moreover, because of her forgery, Jeanette has lost her inheritance rights. As Jeanette began to make a scene, denying it, I elaborated further. Originally, Frank didn't want to leave his estate to Jeanette, so he had taken measures while he was alive. The process of disinheritance had already been filed at the court, meaning Jeanette could no longer inherit anything. The reasons are simple, Jeanette's failure to care for her husband, her routine verbal abuse, and her misappropriation and disposal of his property, to name a few. Since Jeanette denied it, I decided to play the recorded conversations from our home to the gathered relatives. I can't be bothered with taking care of my husband. It doesn't pay to be diligent. Since he doesn't have much time left, it doesn't matter what I do, no one will know or care. Once I get the money, I'll be with my boyfriend. Hearing Jeanette's words from the speaker, the relatives were disillusioned. What further cornered Jeanette was her forgery of the will. I informed her that this could lead to losing her inheritance rights in civil terms and even possible imprisonment in criminal terms. Then Jeanette exclaimed, Frank's company exists! That's mine! Unfortunately, it wouldn't become hers. The reason being that I had already completed the business succession, and the company, which was only a storefront operation at the time, flourished under my management. Using my past skills, I launched an e-commerce shop, which turned out to be a success, bringing the company onto a profitable track. Jeanette had always misunderstood that I was merely assisting Frank and had never imagined that I had taken over the management. Jeanette, if you want to take back the company, please save up the taxes you need to pay to the government and then let me know. I said spitefully. Then Jeanette claimed that even if she didn't receive the inheritance, Harrison would. So I turned to Harrison and said. Here are the divorce papers. You understand why I want a divorce, right? It's because you've always ignored Jeanette's harassment and never helped me. I'll be seeking compensation for the mental anguish I've suffered, no matter how small the amount. Also, I'll demand compensation from Jeanette for causing the breakdown of our marriage. Finally, Jeanette broke down, crying. I just want money, anything. And apologized deeply. No matter what Jeanette did, I had no intention of forgiving her. An apology wouldn't bring back my precious baby. With tears of frustration, I left the funeral. Later, the divorce was finalized, and I confirmed that the compensation from Harrison and Jeanette had been fully deposited. It seemed they used the money from selling their family home for the compensation. About a year later, Harrison appeared before me, holding a marriage registration form. I'm really sorry for hurting you. I only realized what true love was after I lost you. Please, let's try again. I've cut ties with my mother, so if it's okay with you, I'd like us to remarry," he said. Having gratitude towards Harrison's father, I couldn't dismiss him outright. Since Jeanette was the main cause of our divorce, I decided to give living together another try, on a trial basis. Months later, a new life arrived for us. Thus, we rebuilt our lives, and despite everything, we now live peacefully as a family of three.